Welcome to our Bike 101 presentation. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, as I said, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box there. Um, please ask questions throughout. I will pause a couple of times throughout the presentation to take questions. So you're welcome to enter those as we go into that Q&A box. And if you stay till the end today, you will receive promo codes for two local bike and scooter share companies. Um, so that's a great reason to stick around to the end as well. So my name is Sarah Udelhofen. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a program manager at Commute Seattle. I am also co-chair of the Seattle Bicycle Advisory Board. Um, so here's a picture of me in the wild. Um, a friend of mine snapped this photo of me one day while she was walking to work and I was riding in. You can see I've got my yoga mat there and a bike uh, or a bag on my bike. So I was completely ready for the day. Um, I first started riding my bike my bike to work in about 2016. Back then I lived east of Capitol Hill in Madison Valley. So I would bike up and over the hill every day and got used to doing that. Um, I slowly refined my setup and my gear, but it definitely didn't start out that way. So we'll talk a little bit about how I got there today. But first of all, let's do a poll about your biking experience. So if you can read through these and then select the statement that most closely aligns with your situation. All right, great. Looks like we've got a handful who have yet to try bike commuting. There are some who may be used to bike commute, might be in that hybrid work mode right now. A handful that currently commute. Amazing. All right, we can end that poll. Thanks, Madeline. My, my teammate Madeline is on the line today helping out with the back end logistics. Awesome. So definitely a lot of people on who have not tried bike commuting. Um, or used to bike commute, um, but others who currently get out there on their bike. So I definitely love to see that. All right, so um, we live in a society where personal cars are the default, but this often means that you end up sitting in traffic, often spending a lot of time and money um, on your car, and you might not get to get out there in the natural world quite as much. Um, but your commute does not have to be a drag and you showed up here today, so you probably have already heard this secret. Your commute can actually be enjoyable. It can be fun. Uh, studies show that people who bike and walk to work express the highest satisfaction with their commutes. You can save money if you're not paying for gas or parking or car maintenance and inevitable tickets that you might be getting. And your individual decisions and actions really can help the environment. According to the EPA, a typical personal car emits about 4.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. And that's equivalent to the carbon that would be sequestered from 76 trees grown for 10 years. So even if you're choosing to use a bike instead of a car a handful of times, that can be really helpful. But to start off, let's confront some preconceptions about bike commuting. Today, we are not talking about the Tour de France or spandex clad Lance Armstrong style biking. We are talking about biking as a form of transportation, biking that can give you the freedom to get where you need to go around town. There's often a preconception that you have to look a certain way, but you do not. Biking is for anyone, no matter your gender, your size, your level of fitness, etc. Also, some people have been raised to believe that you need special clothes or special gear, but you don't. You can definitely get on your bike in your everyday clothes, and the best bike is the bike you have, is what I like to say. And then also many fear that you can't carry what you need, but there are a lot of solutions for this, so that's another thing that we're going to talk about today. So now that we have established that commuting is for anyone, um, we'll get into some tips for getting started. Um, as we've seen, you're likely here today for getting into bike commuting, but I know many people may already be out there riding around. So also you can think about how you can share some of these tips with other people at your work, your friends, your family to get them into this as well. So first of all, you can recognize that changing your normal routine can be really hard. So I would definitely recommend making it easy for yourself. First of all, be realistic about how far you will be willing to bike. One big tip I have is to consider making your commute multimodal. So you can use transit to help reduce the distance of your commute. 
all of the buses in the Puget Sound have bike racks on the front. So you can see that in the picture here. So King County Metro, Sound Transit, Kitsap Transit, Pierce Transit, all of those have bike racks, which is super useful. Um, we can show you a video of how to load those as well, if that's helpful. You can also take your bike directly onto the light rail. So the picture on the right is a photo I took one day when I was just sitting there with my bike. Um, there is an official bike hanger on the light rail, but I find that if I'm only going for a couple of stops, I just stand there with my bike or I sit with my bike and it's a lot easier that way. So that's that's kind of a sneaky pro tip that, that I would say. Um, you can also start out by taking transit to work and then just biking home. So that's another helpful tip. And if you're new to biking, it might be hard hard to know how long it's gonna to take to bike certain places. So I would really recommend doing a test ride into the office rather than say biking in for the first time before that big 8.30 or 9 a.m. meeting. So um, you could do a test ride on the weekend to see how long it takes, see how your body feels. I would make it as realistic as you can, you know, pack your computer in there, even bring your lunch, something like that, um, try out a different route. So that's a really great way to do that. I know a friend of mine actually did that just this past weekend um, to get to Microsoft. So exciting. And one note for this would be that traffic patterns might be a little bit different on the weekend versus on weekdays. And then another tip is to find a mentor or a buddy to ride with. Um, ask around at work. A lot of people have Slack groups, things like that. Um, you could ask in your neighborhood too, even in a Facebook group or a buy nothing group. There really might be others who are going a similar direction to you or someone who is just up for riding with you to help you get the hang of it. So um, a little bit about bike options. So the bike itself, I always like to say that the best bike is the bike that you have. If you don't have a bike, remember that we do have a lot of great free floating bike share options in Seattle. Um, you could give those a try for test rides. Again, I'll show you those promo codes at the end of the webinar today. That'll get you $5 off um, your first rides. But if you do not have a bike and you have decided that you want to purchase one, some tips for you. Um, first off, there are a lot of bikes out there. It can feel really overwhelming. That's definitely a fact. Um, so I would say consider what type of riding you will do. If you wanna go around town, if you also wanna be able to carry things like carry groceries, I know I use my bike to go grocery shopping. Um, do you also want a bike for exercise? Um, would you consider an e-bike? Those have taken off so much these days and are such an incredible way to expand the distance that you can go. So think about that a little bit. And then also think about if you would consider a used bike, there are a lot of really great local options. We have Recycled Cycles and Bike Works and the Bikery. There's a lot of options like that I'm happy to talk about. Think about your budget a little bit before you go into the bike shop. I would say if you're looking for a new bike, you could expect prices to start at about $600 potentially. Um, so that's definitely just something to think about and to look online and browse a little bit. But bottom line, I would say to shop around actually go to a shop, test ride it, see how it feels for you, ask the bike shop staff some questions and kind of see, see what you're interested in and go from there. Are there any questions before we continue? Ooh, and I like somebody put in the chat, Wonderland Gear Exchange, also a really great price. One question about the price range for an e-bike. That is actually a very good question. I bet other people who are on here today are even more familiar. Someone's saying 1,000 to 15,000. So I know that the price of e-bikes has really come down over the years as they've gotten a lot more popular. So anyone else feel free to pop that in the chat there. So next we're moving into clothing and accessory options. So in reality, you only need yourself, your normal clothes, your bike and safety, safety items. So your helmet, protecting your brain is incredibly important. Please wear a helmet, um, front and back lights, and a bike lock. And in Washington, if you're biking after dark, you are required to have a steady white, white light in the front and either a rear light or a rear reflector on your bike. Um, and I would say always use a steady front white light instead of a blinking light. In the dark, it's actually easier to tell how fast an object is moving 
when there's a steady light instead of a blinking right light. So that's the reasoning for that. Um, and then I know somebody asked a question when they registered about how to know if your helmet is safe. And the government testing body in the US recommends replacing a bicycle helmet every five to 10 years. So that's a great thing to know. Um, and then Madeline's gonna post a link in the chat to Virginia Tech's bicycle helmet rating. And then also to just a, a link of recommendations for bike lights. I know the first one on that list is the Cygo light and that is one that I personally use. And then a little bit of tips about uh, locking your bike. If you can try to lock both your frame and the front wheel to the bike rack, this method of locking is the most secure way to keep your bike safe. So um, we all know that Seattle looks like this sometimes. This is a picture I took riding my bike from home from work one day. Um, so one item that has been a total game changer for me is fenders. So a fender is essentially a covering for your bike tires along the back there, that plastic piece that protects you from the rain. So this keeps the rain from spraying off of your tire onto your back. And there's also fenders on the front that keep the water from spraying up onto your shoes. So um, super big thing here, I would recommend these if you're gonna try to be an all around commuter. Um, you can just take your bike to a shop and they'll help you find fenders that would fit your bike. And then there are some additional items that you might consider to make your commute more comfortable. A raincoat, obviously, hand in hand with the last slide. Um, I per personally, over the years, have learned that I like a raincoat that goes a little bit longer, but that not only zips up from the top, but also unzips from the bottom so that it makes more space for my knees to go up and down on my bike. Um, layers are also really helpful. I've learned that I'm a big fan of using layers. Once you get moving, you also get warm. So rather than putting on my warmest jacket, I wear maybe a thinner sweater and then a puffy and then a rain jacket. So kind of playing with different layers is also really nice. Um, gloves. Uh, showers pass. I have these. I brought them to my desk. Um, I have a pair of showers pass gloves. I really love those and I see a lot of people with them. There's obviously a lot of gloves out there keeping your hands warm. Um, I would recommend bringing a change of shoes. I often just bike in in something like my running shoes and then switch into more work appropriate shoes once I get there. I even keep a couple of pairs of shoes at my desk. So that's something else you can consider. Um, you might wanna wear comfortable workout style clothes and then change into work clothes when you arrive. Um, a lot of workplaces have locker rooms, but I know people often just change in the bathroom too. So some ideas there. And in terms of carrying your things, a backpack is easiest, the most accessible way to go. I'm sure many of you have a backpack lying around your house. Um, the only thing about a backpack is if you're going a little bit farther, this does mean the weight is on your shoulders. Many of us take our laptops to work these days. Your back can get a little bit sweaty that way. So if you're looking to shift that weight elsewhere, you can move the weight onto your bike. So another option is a rear bike rack. So the middle photo here and what are called panniers. There's debate about how to pronounce that, but I say panniers. <laughs> so um, the panniers clip onto your rack and make it really easy for you to put a lot of things into your bags, um, but the weight is carried on your bike instead of on your shoulders. Another option that's gotten really popular these days are a front basket. So I have that option as well. And I actually have a bag made by a local company called Swift Industries that fits inside of my basket and clips on. And I just enjoy that because then my keys are really accessible or if I stop at a stoplight and shed a layer, I can put it right into my basket. So there's a lot of really great options there. And then uh, some tips for getting out the door. Um, again, cut yourself some slack. Changing your routine can be hard and it's a matter of forming new habits. So set yourself up for success by doing that heavy thinking the night beforehand, um, rather than in the morning when you're trying to shuffle to get out the door. So I often check the weather forecast to determine if I want a raincoat or not, if I want gloves, whether I want a warm hat or not, things like that. Um, I often lay those things out, coat, shoes, layers, um, decide if I want a change of clothes, snacks, laptop, all of that. Um, I even pack my bag sometimes the night before, find that makes it way easier to get going in the morning. Um, another thing is to make sure that your lights are charged. Can't tell you how many times I've gone to turn my lights on and they are dead. So 
that's really helpful. Um, I'd also consider leaving extra items at work, just things like socks and underwear, um, even a sweater. A lot of people bring their toiletries to work. I personally had a blow dryer at work for a while, actually. Um, so considering things like that, that'll make it a little bit easier for you. All right, and then any questions? It looks like a couple might have gone by in the chat. What do you got, Madeline? Three of them have been answered in the chat. We had some asks for recommendations on different types of bike shops. Um, if folks have any other questions, feel free to throw them in now and Sarah can answer them for you. Yeah, thank you for giving all of your own thoughts and opinions in the chat. I love when everybody helps each other out. <laughs> I agree, shoe covers can be really helpful for the rain. I also invested in a shoe dryer a couple years ago, and that was also life-changing for me. <laughs> cool, all right, I'll keep rolling. One question um, for you, Sarah. Yes. Do you need to take your seat off when you lock up your bike? Ooh, I typically do not. Um, I do believe it potentially depends on how your seat is attached. Most of my seats, um, they are not a quick release. So some seats, there's just a little lever that opens up and you can pull it off, but mine have to be screwed on. So it would take a while for someone to try to steal it. Um, I personally typically leave my seat on, but I do think really it's a personal preference. It depends if your bike is gonna be sitting there for an entire day out, outside what area it's in. Um, things like that. So it's definitely a little bit of personal preference, but um, that's another thing I'd love to see other people comment on in the chat. Yeah. Then we had one other question on any tips to carrying clothes to minimize wrinkles. Ooh, yes. Um, I have found some great YouTube videos about stealthy folding. Um, so even just looking online for a little bit of that. Um, I've also used the clothing packing cubes and just found that that helps them not get jostled around as much with the other elements that are in my bag, but rolling things has been really helpful for me, so. Yeah, cool. All righty, and then we have a poll for you all. Um, was at this point wondering, wanted to get a pulse about how do you feel about biking in Seattle? Um, how are you feeling about getting out there at this point? We've got some goods and very goods, a handful of neutrals, and just a couple of not goods right now. That's very, it's very okay. It's okay to, you know, be a little timid and just be cautious for getting out there. Um, but next we're gonna talk a little bit about safety and navigating. Before you ride, it is really important to make sure that your bike is safe, especially if you haven't ridden in a very long time, if you've got a bike that you're pulling out of your garage, it's been there for five or 10 years, um, I would recommend bringing it to a shop to ensure your safety. But some really quick uh, getting your bike ready tips is called ABC Quick Check. So A is for air, inflate the tires, um, there's actually a pressure listed on the sidewall of the tire. So that's how you know how, how high to pump up your tires. So that's really helpful. Um, B is for brakes. Just inspect the brake pads for wear, if they're really skinny, if you have the brakes that are on the rim, um, making sure that when you squeeze your brakes, it's actually going to be stopping your bikes. And then C is for chain and your crank. So just check that your chain is free of rust and gunk when you um, rotate it with the pedal, make sure it looks like it is working properly. And then quick is for quick release. So that's the lever that goes through your wheel on both the front and the back and cinches it down. So just making sure that that lever is tightened so that your wheel is in fact securely on your bike. Um, and then there's also some great classes um, at local shops for some basic bike maintenance. REI even has one that they've transitioned to be virtually nowadays. So um, we'll post some of those in the chat as well. All right, some rules of the road. Um, you have the same rights and duties as drivers. So you are required to obey traffic signals and stop signs. Uh, Washington State has a bicycle safety stop law, which allows people who are biking to treat stop signs and yield signs when it is safe to do so. 
when um, there are not other cars at the intersection. That's actually been proven to reduce the number of um, interactions, um, crashes between people driving and people riding bikes. So that's the safety stop law, allows you to treat stop signs as yield signs when it's safe. Um, I'd really recommend, bottom line, you try to be predictable. So make your intentions clear to everyone on the road, to other people biking, to people who are walking, and to people who are driving cars. Um, signal your turns, which we'll talk about on the next slide, and check behind you before you're turning or before you're changing lanes. Um, make eye contact with other road users and even point when needed. I often, if I'm at an intersection and someone who's driving is confused about where I'm going, I just, I just point whichever way. So being communicative. Um, use your voice when you're passing other people who are biking or walking, or if you have a bell, that's also great to use. And then ride on the right of the road. So you should be riding as far to the right as you feel safe doing so, except when you're turning or you're passing. Um, definitely be aware of the door zone. So if there are cars parked on the right side, just really be vigilant about people who might be opening the door to get out of the car. Um, you are allowed to what's called take the lane or to control the lane. So you are legally allowed to control the lane, which means you can ride in the middle of the lane or towards the left of the lane when the lane is too narrow to share it with a car or when it would be unsafe for a car to try to pass you. Um, so I often especially use this if I'm turning or if I'm going around a road that is curved where there's a car waiting behind me to pass me. I don't want them to try to pass me and be in the other lane when a car could come around the blind corner. So situations like that is when you're allowed to take the lane, especially. So a little bit around bike infrastructure. Seattle has a lot of variations of bike infrastructure and I know it can be confusing and there's a lot of new things popping up especially downtown over the last couple of years. Um, so just go through a few of these photos here. Um, on the bottom left, um, there's often just paint on the ground, which indicates with the little bike image that is a bike lane, but I do consider that an unprotected bike lane, meaning it doesn't have a curb next to it that keeps drivers from driving into it and there's not the white flex posts on it. Um, so we do still have a lot of those around Seattle, but the next ones I'll go through are kind of the more protected ones. So above that are fully protected bike lanes. You can see in this picture that there's a planting strip in the middle that's separating people who are driving from getting into the lane. So we are having more and more of that out there in Seattle, which is really great to see that durable and permanent infrastructure. That's something on the bike advisory board. We're always advocating for something like that. Um, and then the lower picture, bike lanes raised to sidewalk level. This is becoming more common. Um, we see this downtown in South Lake Union quite a lot. Um, this is nice because you're protected away from drivers, but you are out there in the pedestrian interface. So um, when there's a bike lane that's raised to the sidewalk like this, I would really just, again, caution you to use your voice to be aware of people who are walking. I often find a lot of people with dogs in the bike lane, very cute, but you know, gently let them know like a bike behind you. So that's a good thing to do there. Um, and then we also have stay healthy streets and greenways. So these are often off of arterials and on slower streets where there's speed bumps and roundabouts. So more residential traffic there. And those are typically really nice, really comfortable areas for you to be riding. So what do I mean when I say to communicate? A big thing is to signal. So these are technically the official signals um, to point which way you are going and to show that you're stopping or that you're slowing. But honestly, one big thing I tell people is just to point, point right and point left. I do think that that is often one of the clearest ways to go to make sure that other people know which way you are going. And if you haven't done this before, I would really recommend even going to like a parking lot or a slow area and just practicing doing this so that you feel comfortable riding for a brief time with only one hand on your handlebar. 
So again, safety is your top priority. Um, so when you're turning and changing lanes, make sure to scan your surroundings, look behind you and signal as we just talked about. Um, when you're turning, you can position yourself in the middle of the lane, like the um, green line A shows here. Uh, and if you don't feel comfortable using the turning line like that, you can use what's called the Copenhagen left. So that's following either the blue path of B where you cross the street and do a little circle to get onto the right side and then go left that way. Or again, like C, cross the street and then just get off of your bike and stand in the crosswalk and walk across just like a pedestrian. So. Those are a couple of good options that can help you feel a little bit safer. And then um, in terms of navigating, I've started pointing people to Google Maps or Apple Maps because that is what people are using on a daily basis and what people are most familiar with. Um, there is a biking layer. Not a lot of people know that. So it turns on green lines on the map. So you can see that screenshot here. I hit the layers button and then turn on biking. And that means that when it's a dotted line, it's typically like a shared Shero road. Um, so not always like protected designated bike lanes, but there's often signage. Um, when it's a dark green, it usually means it's protected bike lane. And then I think there's even like a darker shade of green and that often means it's a trail. So like the Burke Gilman Trail or the West Lake Cycle Track. Uh, Stay Healthy Streets also show up on here in blue which is really nice. But some other resources to compare Google Maps with um, would be SDOT's online bike map. This is in a web page form only. Um, I know I've even seen some of the questions uh, when people registered for this webinar asking, you know, is there something better? At this time, this is what SDOT has in terms of a bike map. Um, so that is better to use if you're gonna be, you know, sitting at your computer trying to plan out A to B where you're going. Um, but Google Maps, Apple Maps are typically more helpful for on the fly type stuff. And then there are also a lot of static maps online, often in PDF or image form, like in the middle here with the Center City Basic Bike Network. Um, there's also a lot of different project pages on SDOT's website for different bike lanes that are going in. So always welcome to poke around for that. And then King County has a regional trails trail finder map. So that's super helpful for seeing what types of trails exist beyond just Seattle itself. Um, I know a lot of people come in from places farther away or perhaps you're just looking to get out and ride farther for exercise and for fun. So uh, yeah, last slide here. Um, May is bike everywhere month. So the Bike Everywhere Challenge is running for the month of May. This is a really great opportunity to encourage new people to try out biking. You get points when you join a team and when you get other people to ride, and then it gives you the opportunity to win things, which is kind of fun. So I encourage you to check that out if you haven't done that yet. And here are some promos for some of our local scooter and bike share companies. So VO, you can use that bike code there or you can use the code there to receive $5 credit um, for your VO ride. And then SPIN, um, you can take their safety quiz and get $5 in ride credit for them as well. Great, so yeah, thank you to VO and SPIN for sharing those codes. And then thank you all so much for joining today. We uh, can follow up now with the rest of our questions that might've appeared. We've got a couple for you, Sarah, um, and thanks to everybody who's chiming in in the chat with your answers as well. It's great to have those crowdsourced. Um, Sarah, here's one for you. Do you think that it's safer to stay in the middle of the road consistently or to move the far right out of the way when you're riding in the street? I do feel that it's safer to ride on the right side of the road. Um, typically, you know, people who are driving are trying to get where they're going. And if the road isn't super narrow, there's usually a little bit of space. You are allowed to have three feet of space by law um, to ride on the side. So I try to stay around three, four feet away and just being aware of my surroundings so I can listen and see when a car is coming and look back and, you know, make them aware that I know that they're there and they'll hopefully pass me 
more cautiously. Um, but again, it's totally personal preference. Um, I have been writing for a lot of years at this point. And so, you know, doing a little bit of deciding where you're writing, um, getting a feel for your level of comfort as you get out there, obviously do what feels the safest for you. Awesome. And then Brenna has a question about the safest way to transport a laptop. Hmm. Um, my laptop has always been completely fine in my pannier bag. Um, I have that next to me too. So um, yeah, I typically just slide my laptop directly in here. Um, I often have like a change of clothes or an extra jacket. So that tends to cushion it a little bit. I know some people just get a simple laptop sleeve. Um, but for me, this bag, this is just an Ortley pannier and it's been quite waterproof. I've owned it since 2016 now, I think. And I've never had problems with my fingers getting wet. So that's really great. And I think similarly in a backpack, a lot of people just use a laptop sleeve. Um, and I've heard of people putting it in like, a trash bag or a Ziploc bag if they're like really worried or if they're gonna be out in like a total downpour, but I've never had an issue. So, oh, and somebody asked who makes your bag? This one is from Ortlieb. I can write that in the chat too. There's some great suggestions from folks in the chat as well. Um, when it comes to where to ride in the lane, Ryan suggests that you don't pop in and out between the lane of traffic. Um, and then we also suggest that making eye contact is critical um, just to make sure that folks know where you are. Yeah, yeah, great suggestions. Yes, yes. Also similar, um, yeah, not popping in and out between the la lane of traffic and between the parking lane is a great tip. Um, again, you don't want to be an unexpected person, just boop, boop. Um, just being predictable, riding in a straight line is always a really good way to go. Ooh, I like that, and I weigh a lot, like I do when I drive. I like that. Thanks. And I know a couple questions came in when people registered as well. Um, Someone said, what is the protocol for passing a bike in a bike lane? And um, I would say treat it similarly as you do when you're driving a car. Um, you know, if the bike lane is really skinny, um, there might not be space for that. So perhaps wait until you are in a wider area or at a stoplight or something like that. Um, you can always use your voice, say passing on your left, um, but it definitely depends on the situation. Um, often I try to remind myself when I'm riding to work, if there's someone who's just slightly slower than me, I remind myself like, okay, this is maybe going to slow me down by one to two minutes. Like, is it that big of a deal? Um, I'd sometimes rather just be a friendly rider than try to aggressively, you know, cut someone off. Um, it's never fun to be cut off. It's never fun to have someone surprise but in front of you. So just being aware and being friendly with people who are around you, I think is a good way to go. There was an excellent question in the chat. Um, maybe we can crowdsource this one too. If there is any universal sign for um, support to people who bike um, and someone suggested a thumbs up, but I'd be curious to hear from anyone else if they have any suggestions of way to show support for bicyclists. Mm. That's a great question. Yeah, I don't think I've heard of any universal sign either. But I like the thumbs up, thumbs up and waving. <laughs> I feel like sometimes I get people who have do a really nice honk where it's like beep, beep, beep. And I always wonder if, if they're saying hi. I like to think of those as positive honks in my mind. Um, and then someone else had asked in their registration, how feasible is biking with buses out of King County itself? And as I mentioned, um, all of the buses in the area do have the bike racks on the bus. So I would definitely recommend utilizing that. Um, and if you're not sure how to load it on the bus, um, there's lots of videos online. I know each of the transit agencies, if you just type like Kitsap Transit, bikes on buses, there's um, definitely uh, how-to videos and tips for that. Someone said, do you ever worry about people stealing your bike right off the bus rack? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I worry more about the fear of my bike falling off, but that has never happened. Those bike racks really are secure. Also, they're right in front of the driver. So the drivers are very friendly on buses. Um, you know, They're the ones who have to stop and watch you load your bike on. So I think that 
the driver being there really makes me feel comfortable about putting my bike on the rack. I'd suggest if you're worried about that, you can always sit up closer to the front of your of the bus so that you can kind of keep an eye on it. Oh, someone says there are some practice bus bike racks around. Yeah, that's true. That Cascade and UW have them. Um, so you can go and practice putting your bike onto the bus rack. Um, it, it can feel a little intimidating to do that for the first time while there's a busload of people on you. Ooh, that's a great question. If there's bike racks on the streetcars. Oh, it says, can I ride if I have a bike stroller wheel wheelchair? Yes. Bikes are allowed space permitting in the center section of the streetcars. Please use the bike racks located in the center section of the First Hill Streetcars and New South Lake Union Streetcar when available. If the racks are occupied, please hold your bike upright while riding. Okay, that's great. Let's see, someone said, is it a breach of etiquette to slow down and tell riders to go in single file? This happens a lot in my neighborhood. It's scenic and drivers get very frustrated around bikes. Um, okay, I have my little Washington bikes tips. Um, bikes may ride two abreast, but not more. So you are technically allowed to ride two people next to each other. Yeah, Washington state law dictates that bicyclists may ride two abreast on sidewalks and roadways, but no more than two riders may ride abreast. So technically, and that's why I do think that these little um, Washington bikes pocket reference can be helpful. Um, it says the exact law numbers on there um, where it can be referenced, which is very handy. Uh, someone says, do experienced riders still have trouble relaxing after locking up bikes and going into a store or somewhere else? I'm paranoid about theft. Yeah, I'd be curious to, to hear other people's thoughts on that. Um, I think for me, it depends where I'm going and depends if it's daytime or if it's evening. For me, it's very easy to take my front light and my back light off my bike. I typically don't leave those on there. I often leave my water bottle on there. I don't think that that would be a huge deal if it were to go missing for me personally, um, but definitely up, up to you and your comfort level. Um, I don't usually leave bags on my bike. I typically want the things that are in the bags anyway. So I usually take those with me if I'm going into a store or just stopping for an errand or something like that. Really great, love all of everyone's excellent knowledge. I know everyone has different experiences um, and different opinions on things. So um, I'm always happy to chat about this. Um, let's see, yeah, a U-lock is recommended over cable locks. Cable locks are more easily cut. Thank you, Ross, good comment. I would also really recommend um, registering your bike on a couple of different bike websites. Uh, um, Bike index is one. Um, so you can find the serial number on the bottom of your bike. Typically it's on um, like between your pedals. Um, so you often have to flip your bike over or really get down there, but you can find your unique code for your bike and go online and register it along with photos. So there's a couple of websites for that. So one is bike index and then I think the other is project. 529. So that's something I really recommend that you do as well, just so that it's an official log of your bike, um, pictures of it so that if it were to be stolen, you can post that online. Let's see, do you lock your bike onto your bike rack when traveling? Do you mean like on a car? Yes. Um, yeah, I think it very much again, it's one of these things that depends if I were like, going to another city and you know driving to Portland with a bike um, I would typically take it inside where I was staying um, but if I'm out on the San Juans in an Airbnb and in a cabin um, with my bike I, I often leave it outside um, but you know carrying on the side of caution and protecting your valuables is, is always definitely a, a good idea you don't want to forget it it often is easy to pop it off and bring it inside with you um, I know hotels often allow you to bring a bike inside if you just ask nicely. So, ooh, do the foot fairies have bike racks? 
what Seattle Water Taxi does in the new ones. Bikes are welcome at no additional charge. Please walk your bike between the pier entrance and the vessel. And then large, um, the big wash dot ferries you can bring your bike onto. And there's not typically bike racks, but there's areas on the side of those, the big wash dot ferries that you can, um, are designated to leaving your bike. And there's like a little rope that you tie it up on. And I never worry about someone stealing my bike on a ferry. Um, they allow bikes to get off first, typically, if you're in the front. So you were in the middle of the water, I figure. It won't go anywhere. <laughs> okay, Kathy, if there's enough demand for bike racks, Washington State Ferries will respond to that. Likely a no, but without telling Washington State Ferries that you want it, you will never get it. <laughs> yeah, there's power in opinions and telling the people what your needs are, for sure. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining. I hope this was informative for you today. Um, this was recorded, so we'll also be posting it on our YouTube channel and, and sending that out. Um, yes, we're going to share the great resource links, and we also have a bike resource page on our website, so you all will receive a follow-up email with all of these resources. Great. Thank you, everyone. All right. Have a good rest of your day.